Hi there, everyone. Um, a few things to chat about today. Uh, first of all, I'll start with showing you my new T-shirt. It's a beauty. That's the name of my substack, A Bold Woman, and that's the substack address underneath it. And this T-shirt was made by a new uh, T-shirt company or a, a T-shirt company that's just setting up in New Zealand now. It's not actually um, available to the public just yet, but they're called the Secret Tea Society. And this is, um, they've formed to start, they'll start making those t-shirts for the bad woman in the world or in New Zealand so far, who want t-shirts that the other t-shirt companies are too pure to make, you know, with slogans and stuff like that, you know, words that might have turf on it or something really bad like that. So anyway, when they're set up, I shall uh, I shall promote them. I shall promote them on my Substack and um, probably here and every and um, X um, anywhere that they may find that they can uh, that people want to find them and go and approach them and get um, get a T-shirt that you know the other T-shirt companies. Uh, that doesn't align with their values so anyway anyway talking about x i just want to talk about an interestingly um little exchange i've had with somebody on there and uh and i was talking about we've got a new human rights commissioner now here in new zealand and um and a new race relations commissioner and there's been um one hell of a lot of controversy amongst the, let's call them the woke, because these two people aren't woke. They're just regular people who weigh up all the facts um, and come to a sensible decision, you know, that sort of thing, instead of like, oh, what are, the, what are people's feelings about all this? Now, I know that feelings have to be taken into account sometimes, but sometimes it's just the facts of the matter that we want to sort of um, get resolved. And these two people, I think, from what I understand, because I don't know them personally, but other people do, and they say that they're, um, they're very good like that. They, they uh, all I can say is that they seem to be sensible people and we haven't had that in our Human Rights Commission for a while. So um, apparently this race relations Commissioner, Melissa Darby, she liked a tweet once that said Chanel Lal um, should be locked up, you know, and Chanel Lal, for those who, who um, aren't familiar with that name, he is the man who was instrumental in whipping up the mob violence, the worst mob violence against women in New Zealand's history when Kelly J. Keane came here in March last year. Um, and he was then, uh, a while later, given a job by the New Zealand Labour Party. And people are worried about, you know, Melissa Darby liking a tweet that, um, you know, oh, they consider not to be sort of quite the thing that she should be liking. Yeah, well, I tell you what, when a man like Chanel Lal is given a job by the New Zealand Labour Party, I don't think Melissa Darby's got anything to worry about, about liking a tweet that some people may think is not quite the thing to like. And, and the leader of the Labour Party, Chris Hipkins, he was interviewed on the platform um, a while ago, and Sean Plunkett asked him the question about Chanel Lal being employed with the New Zealand Labour Party. And, you know, Chris, Chris Hipkins, you know, said, oh, no, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, people should be given a second chance. Now, that tells me that he knows that Chanel Lal did something that wasn't that great, but still employed him. Yeah, so anyway... So that, so that was the um, guts behind this tweet, and um, that was a long way of uh, describing it. But anyway, 
um, some guy came back to me and said that he wanted me to explain how Chanel Lal was instrumental in whipping up this violence. Now, anyone who's been in New Zealand at the time, and even now, knows how that happened. Chanel Lal was on TV, he was on X, he was on all sorts of platforms, and he was and he was instrumental in whipping it up. There's no doubt about that. So um, I told this guy that I wasn't going to explain the bleeding obvious to him. <laughs> so, I mean, do you blame me? And he came back, and um, and this is the thing I think that they're starting to say now. We know, because they ask these questions that are monumentally stupid, and then you just cannot be bothered getting into it. So then they come back with, this is, I think, a new thing, come back with, so you've got nothing then. So anyway, I basically said I had, um, I basically said, dear Warwick, I decline your invitation to explain the bleeding obvious and instead invite you to take a hike. Um, and yes, I'm completely aware of all responses you'll have to this, so perhaps save your breath too. And that's when he came back and said, oh, so you've got nothing then. And I said, I said, well, that was on my list of, of anticipated replies from you. And you're certainly right. I have nothing for you. Um, I said, I don't expect you'll stop trying to have the last words, so knock yourself out. And this is, and he came back with, and I, and I actually rather like this, to be honest. He came back and said, yes, and I knew you were going to de deflect and declare your own superiority at the same time. Well, wow. <laughs> it's all very predictable, Katrina. You have one focus and zero objectivity, coupled with an ego the size of a planet. Well, you know, I don't know. Have I, have I got superiority and an ego the size of a planet? I'm not sure, but if he wants to think so, well, I'm not going to, I'm not going to argue with him. So anyway, that was a little bit of amusement for, for a little, for, you know, 10 minutes. So now today I actually want to talk also about the, the New Zealand Law Commission and how they are, um, put, they've put together a proposal to put the word gender into law. And this was, um, have a look at my wee notes here. This was a bill that was first proposed by Dr. Elizabeth Kirikiri of the Green Party. Now she got booted out of the Green Party for allegedly, allegedly bullying. And it was picked up, the bill was picked up by Debbie Narewa Packer of Te Party Māori, which is the Māori Party. And so the Law Commission has been tasked with looking into uh, the possibility or the potential of putting the word gender and gender identity, I think both those, into, um, into the Human Rights Act. And so they have put out a 211-page issues paper to review this proposal, because the, the, the Law Commission um, are a non-Crown entity and an agency, how do they how do they describe themselves? An agency, a reform, a, a, a law reform agency. And so they put out this 211 issues paper to review this proposal. And um it came across to many of us like it was dictated from transgender lobbyists, to be honest, with a few um, with a few appeasement crumbs thrown in there for those who don't go along with gender ideology. And the Law Commission also stated that they only, and this is to paraphrase, they didn't want to count up the options with which most people agreed, but they only wanted to consider you know, well put together submissions, you know, with well, with well sort of articulated points and things like that, which, you know, I, I thought that was actually sort of quite bad to, 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 to be elitist like that. So the Women's Rights Party and Manawe Hini Koriro combined in a delegation to go and see the Law Commission. 
and put some submissions to them because you can make submissions on this. Sorry, I should, I should have said that you can make submissions on this issues paper up till the 5th of September. So we went along and to have a, you know, put our submissions to them in person. Um, and unfortunately, some miscommunication and misunderstanding meant that we ended up only uh, doing it by Teams, which is like Zoom anyway. So I'm going to read out, I've written a blog about it, of course, <laughs> on my subject, what you saw on my t-shirt. Um, read a blog about it. I'll read out the blog and I've also got the the um my I've also got my my submission there in there which I made to the law commission and I'll read that out as well so here we go it's headed up don't put gender into law it's a terrible idea the women's rights party and Manawahini Kuriro tell New Zealand's law commission and I can see straight away after looking at this so many times and proofreading and everything, I've actually made um, a bit of a typo in the heading. <laughs> I've left out where I said it's a terrible idea. I've actually left out the A, so I'll have to go and put that in. So anyway, to carry on. Thursday this week saw me once more winging my way to Wellington, this time to meet with New Zealand's Law Commission to make an oral submission to them in person. It could have been done online, of course, as others did, but I wanted to meet them face to face, so I jumped on a big silver bird and went there instead. I was part of a combined delegation from the Women's Rights Party and Manawahini Kuriro to tell the Law Commission that putting the word gender into the Human Rights Act was a terrible idea. As it turned out, some misunderstanding and miscommunication saw us presenting our oral submissions to them via Teams from an external meeting room anyway. However, I still got the pleasure of an infrequent, infrequent get together with six other women in the delegation. The Law Commission has put together what, <coughs> excuse me, what they call an issues paper to review a proposal to put the word gender into legislation. It's a nightmare of blood boiling bollocks to any sensible thinking person and a wet dream for transgender lobbyists. And I've put a link there to an article by this um, dude called Paul Thistle, who's a transgender activist. Submissions from our delegation on this issues paper will be published on the Women's Rights Party website on Monday, 19th of August, with Manawahini Kuriro's submission published on their own website. The submission I made is also published at the bottom of this blog piece. The Law Commission's hearing panel was made up of Professor Claudia Geiringer, and I'm afraid I'm not 100% sure if I've said that last name properly. She, her, and email signatures. Two young women who were there to take notes from the meeting and an older bloke who jokingly told us how the only boomer in the group, i.e. he, had been given the job of looking after the technical side of things. Yes, it was kind of amusing on one level, but the realisation that the group was made up mainly of those not long out of university and a university professor and therefore potentially indoctrinated with gender ideology was disconcerting on another. Claudia was professionally suave. Suave? Is that the way it works? Suave? Suave? And opened the meeting by having us all introduce ourselves before we started reading our submissions. Sal Grover from Australia also made an online appearance, as did Christine, who has filed a personal grievance against her employer, the Inland Revenue Department New Zealand, about being taken to task for a quip she made on the woman's intranet regarding free menstrual products in the men's bathrooms. In recent times, Christine has become aware of another Inland Revenue branch where the female employees give each other a secret hand signal whenever the male employee who says he's a woman uses the female bathroom. And this way, they know not to go in there when he's using it. We weren't told what the secret hand signal was, but two of the women in our delegation immediately made the male wanking movement <laughs> as a guess. Dear reader, I'm afraid all we delegates sniggered. There wasn't a lot of time for questions and dialogue with the Law Commission hearing panel after we finished making our submissions and Claudia wound up the meeting with gracious words to us. 
battle-hardened old turfs that we are, we receive this with our usual cautious distrust, knowing that a smile today and a decision tomorrow may have nothing in common. Claudia also gave a summary of what their intentions were in creating the issues paper. To me, it came across as saying they were only exploring the idea of putting the word gender into the Human Rights Act at this point in time, yet in the issues paper they state that we reached the preliminary conclusion in this chapter that an amendment to section 21 is necessary and desirable. And we seek feedback on that preliminary conclusion. Section 21 is the prohibited grounds of discrimination in the Human Rights Act. It certainly appears that the Law Commission is favorable to the idea of adding the word gender to this section. We can only wait and see now what their final recommendation is. Afterwards, we were invited back to a Wellingtonian woman's house for a shared meal. She wasn't part of the delegation, but opened her home to us. I'm always awed by the generosity of those who do that for people they barely know and provide food and drink for them. There's nothing quite like sitting around a table sharing a meal and a wine after an event. It solidifies the camaraderie as well as just being fun. I won't name that woman, but you and the friend who helped know who you are and your warm hospitality was wonderful. So my submission to New Zealand's Law Commission. I said to them, I'm here today to present on three subjects. The first addresses the undemocratic position the Law Commission has taken and not counting the option with which most people agree. The second addresses the language used in the review. The third the concerns the request for evidence about the negative impacts of allowing men who identify as women into female spaces. And I'm going to say something a little bit amusing about that later on. Point one, the submission process. In the introduction to the review, the Law Commission states it's not their intention to count up the options with which most people agree. I disagree with this position as the proposal to put gender and gender identity into the Human Rights Act affects all New Zealanders, not just those capable of making a presentation deemed acceptable by the Law Commission. I find it undemocratic that the Law Commission is not giving stronger weight to the option with which most people agree. Many people are unable to express themselves in a clear and articulate manner. Nor does everyone have a laptop, computer, or printer on which to read or print the 211-page review or even the 21-page summary, and there was no observable option to request a paper copy. Many people only have mobile phones on which to read the review and make a submission. Multiple factors can restrict what people say and how they say it. Therefore, the elitist singular approach to submissions should be discarded. The majority opinion does matter. Point two, language. The review uses the same language and terminology introduced and promoted by transgender lobbyists. The use of this language gives the impression of a narrative running through the review that favors the views of those lobbyists at the expense of the views of women whom this will affect. Such an impression leaves me concerned that women have been expected to sacrifice their rights and agency for the sake of men who identify as women. For the sake of clarity, a woman means an adult human female. The prefix cis, C-I-S, is not required. The prefix cis is used throughout the review and is one example where the Law Commission has adopted language associated with transgender lobbyists. The words gender and gender identity, mutable concepts, are also part of the preferred language of transgender lobbyists. If gender and gender identity are put into the Human Rights Act in Section 46, which allows for single sex spaces, it will serve to put those words in contest with sex, with the real possibility of women's sex-based rights being eroded. Nowhere is this erosion of women's sex-based rights more obvious than where women and girls will potentially be forced to accommodate any man at all who gender identifies as a woman in their spaces. 
The fact is there are councils which have already forced women and girls into this situation. For example, the Christchurch City Council. In their recent equity and inclusion policy, the council refused to put the word sex in the list of people who should have equity, but included the word gender. This was questioned by councillors Henstock and Keown when the policy was put to the council, but they were overridden. In the video of that meeting, Councillor Templeton, the councillor driving the policy, can be heard to give her justification for excluding the word sex. Direct reference was given in that justification to the views of transgender lobbyists. The tone of her argument came across as considering the word sex to be in contest to the word gender and a threat to the precedence of gender identity over sex. The exclusion of the word sex from the Christchurch City Council's policy has the consequence of eroding women's sex-based rights. The policy enables any man at all who gender, who gender identifies as a woman to have free and unfettered entry into all female spaces and council-owned uh, facilities. Whilst not all men will identify as a woman and do this, the choice is entirely theirs. The consequence of this is that women and girls in Christchurch have been relegated to being less than men who identify as women due to the council deciding that gender identity trumps sex. If the words gender and gender identity go into the Human Rights Act legislation, including section 46, which gives the right to have single sex spaces, it may be extremely difficult to undo this consequence. More weight needs to be given to women's sex-based rights than is discussed in the review. Point number three, the request for evidence about the negative impacts of allowing men who identify as women into female spaces. Periodically, it gets stated that no hard evidence exists to show that allowing men who identify as women into female spaces is detrimental to women and girls. This is not true. The entire history of humankind and police records as far back as they go show that men as a group of any stripe or identity are a threat to women and girls. No group of males is accepted. Not minority, marginalized or vulnerable groups. They all have the same mix of men in them. However, we appear to be expected to undergo this experiment of allowing men who identify as women into our spaces purely because they have provided stories about being a minority, marginalized and vulnerable. This anecdata, based on personal experience and feelings, is treated as if it were evidence. No hard evidence was required to show that men who identify as women don't have the same levels of criminality as men who have transitioned. To my knowledge, the same hard evidence which is deemed to be absent from women's reasons for not wanting men who identify as women in our spaces is also absent from the reasons which those same men give for wanting access to female spaces. At chapter 13, paragraph 19, the Law, Law Commission states that it's interested in learning what evidence there is to support the concerns women have about sharing female-only spaces with men who identify as women. To date, no one in any position of leadership or authority has asked for women's stories on how we feel about knowing that any time we go into a female space now, we go in there with the knowledge there may be men in there who say they're women. We haven't been asked how we feel when we encounter them, what behaviours from them we've seen or experienced whilst in that space, the visceral reaction by abused women upon seeing them there, and how those encounters may negatively affect our future use of facilities and engagement in public life. No official avenue has ever been provided to tell those stories honestly and without fear of reprisal. The collection of anecdata and acting on that has been one-sided only in favour of men who identify as women. It is an outrage to say or imply that no evidence exists when women have only ever been shut down, humiliated and vilified when trying to speak of it or provide it. 
The Law Commission urgently needs to implement an official avenue to collect evidence from women and girls about sharing female facilities with men who identify as women. Finally, we will all have to live with the consequences of gender and gender identity are put into the Human Rights Act. Rights Act. So all our voices need to be heard, heard, not just the voices of vocal lobbyists. So what I'm going to uh, just read out, tell you now a little bit of an excerpt of an article which um, Graham Linehan actually posted on X. I saw it today. And this is an article from a trans activist in the UK. And um, I'm, I'm going to presume this trans activist is a he, even though the name is clear. Um, and he is saying that he's taking himself out of activism because he's absolutely fed up with the way trans activists have done activism in the UK. So it's a bit of a, you know, it's a bad rant, you know, and it's about anti-trans, there's some bigots that and whatever, you know, the usual carry on. But what is really amusing in this in this article, and I'll read it out, is he talks about, um, he talks, he says, I'll read out this paragraph, let's take adult trans healthcare in, as an example. We have known for the better part of a decade that adult services in the UK are frankly abysmal. What have the organizations done? Did they gather the data to prove just how bad it is? Did they go to policymakers with hard data? Nope. Mostly they relied on anecdotal, experience related information and goodwill under the mistaken assumption people would do the right thing. What I found really interesting is basically he's saying the same thing as I put in my um, submission to the Law Commission about the no hard data being provided to, well, my case, in my case, about get, for men who say the woman to get access to female spaces. And it's only just been stories, personal experiences, information that, that they have um, made, that they've gathered and presented. And that has been in so many cases, I, I mean, I would say not in New Zealand, taken as as what I said in the submission as evidence, and and um, and well, I, I mean, he calls it goodwill in his article. I I don't know if I would actually sort of go to the extent of saying that the people who implemented these policies did it out of goodwill. I really I really don't know what they're driving. Um, what was behind it, what drove them to do it, because goodwill, I don't know, I think I think that's a generous, that's a, a generous interpretation of why they did it, why they've allowed men, just on the basis of stories, personal stories, to get access to women's spaces and sports, <clears throat> excuse me, um, but I just found it interesting that basically this trans activist backs up what I said. Anyway, that's it for today, and um, I shall um, put a link to that uh, story, that article, below, so you can read it if you want to. Um, and once again, I'll show you my T-shirt again, because it's so great. <laughs> and I will, when that, um, when that comes on board, when that business, little business comes on board, I shall promote that as well. And anyone in New Zealand who wants... Um, a turfy t-shirt or such can get one from there. Um, what else? Um, the, I, won't, I won't put a link to my blog um, underneath this because I want to actually post this video on X. And X has a beef with Substack and anything with a Substack link in it, um, they shadow banned. So if you want to go to my blog site, just go and have a, another look at my t-shirt and you'll find it there. Okay, uh, catch you another time. Bye.